Good morning, students. This is Mr. Sayer, and it is a wonderful Wednesday morning. And today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Romans and how they expanded during the Roman Republic and it carried on over into the Roman Empire. So the content objective today is to describe and identify the strategies used by the Romans to conquer much of Europe and North Africa. And the langu language objective is going to be that after this, you'll be able to write down the details of how they expanded and how this was a good strategy. But in addition, you're going to be able to explain the feelings and thoughts of Roman legionary soldiers and the soon-to-be-conquered peoples in the Rome's expanding territories. So this is when Rome was at its height in terms of its largest possible uh, territory. And in addition, you can see we're going to be talking about the legionary soldiers and their techniques as a group, not just individuals. So how did Rome expand? So in the beginning, they were this small little kneecap on the Italian peninsula. And um, that was from 500 to approximately 264. So for 250 years, roughly, they were tiny. Okay. And then what happened was in the next roughly 100 years, they expanded to this territory under the Roman Republic. And then during the final years, the final 100 years of the Roman Republic, they expanded into these yellow areas and started to take over North Africa and then parts of the Middle East, and all the way up into Gaul, which is modern-day France. And then finally, during the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire was basically about 150 years, they expanded all the way up into Britain and all the way out to conquering pretty much almost around the Black Sea, down through Egypt, and all the way here into Morocco and more of North Africa. But they basically had taken over the Mediterranean Sea as a result of their expansion. Now, how did they do that is the question. So as we're doing this, what's going to happen is you are going to be answering these notes. Okay? And so we're going to start off here with Roman legions and, and expansion and the four reasons why the Romans were able to conquer so many people. And I'm not going to keep referring back to this. You can see this. Um, but you will need to fill out this whole thing. And this is all answered from this slideshow. So how did Rome keep conquering, expanding, and controlling more territory is the question. And the answer is the Roman army, exclamation point. So we'll be talking about the legionary soldiers, their techniques as individuals and their skills and their weaponry, but also as a group. How was Rome really good as a group to be able to take over? So the four reasons why Romans were able to conquer so many people is, first of all, they had a strong army. They were strong. They were skilled. Um, they were experienced. Number two, their enemies were not united. They really didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have a plan that was practiced, which was organized. The Romans had a professional army, which means they were paid just to fight, just to build and conquer. Um, but they weren't just fighting. We'll talk more about that. But the enemies, they did know how to fight, but they weren't united because they didn't have all the time as professionals do. They were doing things like farming and all kinds of other things, building and things like that, but they also didn't have the numbers. Number three, Rome was well organized. And again, we will get into that more. And finally, Rome became confident and experienced because they had a lot of experience in fighting, in working together. Now, these were the different kinds of soldiers that the Romans had. So the legionary soldier was your citizen soldier, okay? And that means they were soldiers, they were professional soldiers, but they were citizens of the Roman Republic and then later the Empire. Now, the next 
is the non-citizen soldiers, and these were the auxiliaries right here. So these would be people that joined the Roman army, and they joined it from the provinces. And the provinces was what we would call states today in the United States. But they would conquer these territories, and then these people would volunteer to join them. And the reason they would join is because if they stayed in the Roman army for 25 years, then they would gain citizenship, and so would their kids. So then, from that point on, all of their family would always be Roman citizens, and there was a lot of advantages to being a citizen. You also had the centurions, and you also had the cavalrymen. Okay, and the centurions were the people that were over 100 people, 100 soldiers, 100 legionaries. And centurion comes from the Latin word century, which is 100 years. Or, you know, a dollar is made out of 100 cents. So that's where we get those words. Cavalryman is somebody that rides a horse and fights from a horse. So... What kind of soldiers did they have? Well, there was people that were in charge of art artillery. That means they would use large weapons. Then there was people that were cavalry. These are specialists on horseback. And number three is centurions. And they would lead 100 men, and specifically 100 auxiliaries and legionary soldiers. Not just, just regular men. Now, what armor, weapons, and equipment did the Romans have? Well, right here you can see they had shields, and then they would wear a helmet, and then they would have a dagger and a pike. Now, the pike is not shown here, and really the dagger isn't shown here. It's kind of shown right here. It's a small knife, so that's used for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, they had a sword. They had javelin, which is right here. And then they would have light armor and sandals. And sandals were very important. They had grip, and it, was, it allowed them to travel quickly and protect their feet. If they damaged their feet, it would actually take two people out because one person would have to carry them, and then they would be out because their feet were injured. So that was sometimes a way that enemies would attack them is to attack their feet. They would also have building and camping equipment. Building equipment because once they got to the place where they were going or even along the way, they might build things like roads. Once they got there, they might be build, building things like forts. Um, so they were bringing their own equipment to do those things. Now, the, armors that, the armor that they had, here is a javelin. Now, the javelin had this weight or ball. And it allowed you to throw it underhand. And what would happen is, is it would go right through the person and make a small hole like this. But then when you try and pull it out, the barb on it would make a hole like this. And so obviously that could really hurt somebody. As we talked about, the dagger was right here and the sword is here. So this is like a knife. That's very close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Here are the sandals with grip and they can march quickly on them. This is what's called a pike. And the pike is about eight feet tall. That's about me standing straight up, holding my arm all the way up, and I'm 6'4". So that's a long uh, spear. And what you would do is you would use that especially against horses. And you would dig the bottom end, the non-sharp end, into the ground and leave it on the ground. And as you were being attacked, if they had cavalrymen that were coming after you, you would then, right before the horse could turn, pull up the, the sharp end, leaving the dull end stuck in the ground, and then they would point it right at the chest of the horse, and that would kill the horse because it wouldn't move. Trying to use a spear in your hand or a sword in your hand against a horse was very difficult because horses were so big and strong. But the pike, they couldn't really move. Now, some people might go, oh, my gosh, the poor horse. You know what? If we were fighting and it was me or the horse, I would fight for my life. Okay? Because if I didn't, that horse and soldier would kill me and many other Romans. And so it was basically self-defense. Now, the other things you'll find here is this is a pickaxe. This is a shovel. And those would be used for digging and building, and I'll show you pictures later of them doing that. 
they also had like a backpack and in here they would have food they would carry their own water they would have their own pots and pans for cooking um, the food would be in here right up here is a rucksack or basically a sleeping bag so they were pretty mobile and basically they could walk between 10 and up to 50 miles in one day which was pretty brutal and the other thing that's kind of interesting about the roman soldiers is they would not attack you with 10 50 they would attack you with thousands of troops and when they would attack you with thousands of troops they weren't sneaking up on you what they would do is they would mark in, march in formation towards towns. And so as they would come, sometimes you would hear them before they even crested the mountain and went over the top of the mountain, you would hear them coming. And they had these things right here, which was called cingulums, okay? And the cingulum is the belt of intimidation because as they were marching, these belts would be used for two things. Number one, the more strips of metal you have hanging down, then the higher rank you are. And you can actually see this right here on this guy. And so what would happen is, is this would, the more you would have of these, the higher rank you are. And this would protect a guy. This would protect his groin. But the other thing is, is that as these would clank together, that would be very intimidating because the townspeople would hear not only you marching, but they would hear these cingulums, clank, clank, clank. When I was in junior high, we used to watch a movie called Jaws. And Jaws, there was a soundtrack and it was like, don on, don on. And the faster and louder it would get, the closer you knew the shark was there. And even if you didn't see it, it was intimidating. So the Romans would intimidate a lot of people and a lot of people would just surrender. And that was fine with the Romans. They didn't want to kill everybody. But what would happen is they would surrender and the Romans would say, that's fine. As long as you follow our rules, then you can be our allies and we will work together. And so they were famous for a couple different things. One was they would attack in waves, very organized, of lines with their strategy. And um, the second thing is, is there was a formation that they called the testudo, which was like a tortoise. So if they got next to a fortress or a wall um, that they would be fighting against, this way nobody could drop stuff on them and they couldn't attack them from the front. Now getting back here to their waves, their strategy, you have to realize that the Romans, like as I said, would attack with thousands. And what they would do is they'd put the bowmen back here, bow and arrow. And what would happen is, is back here they'd have a centurion and up here they'd have a centurion. And they would organize in such a way that you can see these guys aren't organized. These are the enemy. And then the guy in the back would say, fire, and they would shoot arrows and the arrows would go up. And as they were about to hit these guys in the head, this guy, which is the centurion here, with his sword, would thrust it out there and they would toot this horn, this trumpet, so they could hear all the way down in the midst of all this commotion. And they would throw in such a good way that they would be, number one, accurate, but number two, as the bow and arrow guys would shoot their arrows, as they were about to hit the, the enemy in the head, these guys would throw, and what would happen is, is that the, the enemy would have to make a choice. Do I protect my head or do I protect my chest where they're throwing? And so that would happen once. Then they'd say, shoot, and the next row would shoot. And then the next, these guys would kneel down. These guys would throw another round and then shoot. And it would be a third round and these guys would throw. So by the time they even were going to battle with them in a hand-to-hand -hand situation with swords, with daggers, they had already wiped out and killed sometimes a quarter, a third, sometimes a half of the other uh, soldiers, their enemies. So oftentimes the Romans won their battles without even fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat and people would surrender. So they were very, that's when I say they're organized and their tactics were so good that people kind of knew this was going to happen 
And so it was very intimidating. So a lot of them just surrendered. Now, soldiers did not just have the job of fighting. They did fight, they protected, and they fought for land. But once they had taken the land, they became the peacekeepers, and they would actually live in the towns. And what would happen is, as you can see from this picture, some ideas about the Romans. So you can see right here, they could write, they could read. So this is actually graffiti, and they would actually make little memes. And this is hanging out kind of in a bar where you can get food, you can get drink. It was called a pub. So these were for wine. Here, this was for food. You lift it up, and underneath is a container. Um, and they know this from a place called Pompeii, which you, in sixth grade, were supposed to learn about, which was demolished by um, Mount Vesuvius, which was a volcano that just covered the town. Nobody knew about it until years later when a farmer found it. But here's another thing. These guys are gambling. This guy is wearing his rank right here, okay, his singulum. And he can show, you know, he's showing off, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, of higher rank. And he's always ready to fight because he's got his sword with him. And this looks like a local girl. And maybe he might just marry this woman. Because even though you're not supposed to and the Romans had rules against it, he knows he might live in this town for 10, 20 years. And so he's committed to being in the army for 25 years, and then he would get paid for the rest of his life. She thinks, hey, this is a good deal. If I marry this guy, he's got a good paying job. Okay, he's got a nice place to live. And so there was a lot of intermarriage between the Romans and the soon-to-be colonized people. Two more jobs. One was they were builders. So they would build the roads build the buildings, aqueducts, aqueducts carry water. This right here is a fort. This right here is a workout area. This right here is an arena like the Colosseum where the, the Raiders used to play. And that's where they got the idea. They copied the Romans. Right here, you can see they're building, um, looks like a road, or this could be the fortress. They stayed in their armor just in case all of a sudden somebody was gonna attack. They would be ready to fight. So they weren't just builders. That's doing the hard work. They were the designers. They were the engineers. So they knew how to design infrastructure. Um, two rights of the people conquered by the Romans. First of all, the most important is they could govern themselves as long as they became Roman allies. And so they had to follow what I call POP. It helps me remember. They had to pay their taxes. They had to obey the Roman law, and they had to keep the peace. Now, some of you think, that's kind of crazy. But can you imagine if you and your sibling who fight all the time, one day he, you come home and they say, I'm tired of fighting. Listen, no more fighting, okay? And if you do, I promise to be obedient to you. Obedient? Not only that, I will keep the peace. I will not fight. Not only that, I will pay you like taxes. A lot of people would say, that's good. I can deal with that. So the next thing is, is that they were also granted the right of citizenship, as I said, if they were in the military for 25 years. And that was extended to the family. Now, another way of attacking, which they didn't really know much about the, the seas and the oceans, and they didn't know really about shipping. But one day a ship from the Greeks washed up on shore and it was a battleship of the Greeks. And so what happened was, is that the Romans learned from the Greeks and this is a Greek ship and you can see all the oars and you can see the guys that are, you know, rowing the boat and there's different levels. And what happens is, is that the Greeks were very smart. What they would do is they would ram another ship. And right here, this is a battle ram under the water. And so they would ram another ship and then pull away and sink the other ship and they would win the battle. The Romans thought this was a great idea. So they copied them and they built these ships. But the Romans were such great fighters that they said, you know what, we're going to do something even better. So they built the ships exactly the same. But then what they did was they built like a big plank, a big piece of wood. And the piece of wood, when they got close and they rammed the other ship, had a big, huge nail in it, and it would drop down, and the nail would stick into the deck of the other ship. 
and they would run across and attack, and then they would capture some slaves. They were worth money. Not only would they capture slaves, they would gather some of the riches from the ship. And sometimes they would actually capture wealthy people off the ship and hopefully get a ransom from them. So the Romans took it to the next level. And the Romans typically did that. They learned from other people and then they became even more dominating. Now, did they win all their battles? And the answer is no. There were some people that fought back. And one of the people that was famous was this woman named Boudicca. And she was British. And what happened was, was that the, that the Romans attacked her family, killed her husband, and also she, they were horrible to their daughters. They assaulted their daughters, and she said, I will not let this stand. So she raised up a groups, and, uh, groups of uh, British soldiers, and the soldiers fought back, and they killed between 70 and 80,000 Roman soldiers. And so that was uh, really difficult for the Romans to stomach. Finally, they did capture her and they were going to kill her, but she wasn't going to let herself be killed. What she did was she drank poison instead. And, um, but she did show that some people could fight back against the Romans. And I'm going to put this video link also on here. So if you want to watch it, it's kind of a music video. It's pretty cool. Um, there was another one. Here's Boudicca looking angry. There was another guy. His name was Braveheart. And he was in Scotland. And they got sick and tired of trying to fight him. And they just said, forget it. And they built a wall called Hadrian's Wall, named after Emperor Hadrian at the time. And they just said, forget them. Okay. They had conquered enough land. That's why they stopped. So moving on. Now that you have all those notes, what are you going to do with them? What you're going to do is you're going to do a thing called sensory figures. And what you're going to do is you're going to come up with a creative title. You can see both of these people have one sense or feeling here. And so you want to be specific. Don't just say, I feel pain. Tell me why they feel pain. So this is a legionary soldier, and he says, I feel the pain in my feet from marching 50 miles today. That is specific, and that's a good sentence. Here, this is the soon-to-be-conquered colonist. It could be a man, could be a woman. Hope, pointing at the heart, hopes with his heart or her heart. I hope I'm conquered by the Romans because then I'll have a better life. So what's going to happen is you need to pick five more of these, okay? And so you can pick any of these except for hope for this one. And you can pick any of these except for feel for this one. And you're going to do five more. You can do four to five more. And I guess I should change that. Um, but use your creativity. So if you forget what I said about that, here are the instructions. Requirements for of your sensory figure. The assignments label both sensory figures on the Google Drawing. And the Google Drawing will be attached to this assignment. And it'll be a separate thing in Google Classroom. So number one, add a creative title related to the interaction between the figures. Number two, add four to five more specific senses to each of the figures that have not been used on that figure, i.e. don't use hope for the soon-to-be colonized person since it has already been used on them. You can show your creativity with your, should say, words, and you can add emojis if you want, whatever. Um, but just, I should be able to read this and say, okay, I get it. They understand what was going on during this time period. And so you are going to get something that looks like this. And here it is. And so this is going to be your sensory figure. And what you're going to do is add your name here by so-and-so. Okay, so that's your assignment for today. And I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.